You have a new book out, When It's Your Turn to Serve, Experiencing God's Grace in His Calling for Your Life. Tell us a little bit about this book. Well, thanks for having me on, Billy. Um, But I'm very excited about this book because I wanted to be able to tell the story of uh, some of the behind the scenes things at the White House and the governor's residence, but things that talked about the initiatives that I was able to support as First Lady of Indiana and Second Lady of the United States. So it's not so much a memoir or a story about my life, but it tells some of the things that I was able to do with God's grace uh, at when I was First Lady and Second Lady. And the whole point of the book is to encourage the reader by telling these stories to encourage the reader to be willing to step out and step up and and serve when they feel God calling them. Yeah, and that's really been the story of your family. You know, so many times reading about your family, talking to different family members, hearing about the calling and feeling that, you know, God has called you into all the different arenas that you've been and Obviously, you've been in many different arenas. Your husband has served in Congress. He's been a governor running for president, served as vice president. What, what for you was different? And maybe, maybe there weren't a lot of differences, but I am curious, when you became second lady of the United States, how that differed from those other experiences that you had? That's a great question uh, because, you know, honestly, as we stepped into it, it was an unknown for us as well. Uh, in fact, I know that you know my daughter, Charlotte. She and I wrote a book uh, with our bunny called uh, Marlon Bundo's A Day in the Life of the Vice President because we were like, what does a vice president do? <laughs> and we <laughs> were the second family. So uh, that's a great question. Um, as a congressional spouse, you really don't get too involved in anything, in any initiatives or any issues. I didn't, at least. Um, And that was when we were raising our family. And so I really didn't have time to do a lot of outside things. But as First Lady of Indiana, I wanted to be a good steward of that opportunity. And I really wanted to make the most of it. And so I tell the story in the book about how we started uh, a foundation called the Indiana First Ladies Charitable Foundation. Because I felt like for this little window people will take my phone call (laughs) and people will listen to me and we can do something good with this. When uh, I became the second lady, uh, I had a little bit bigger staff. We had eight people. um, And as first lady of Indiana, I only had three staff people. Um, But as second lady, I I had a little more staff. Um, We had an opportunity to do a few more things And I got a note, I tell this story too in the book, Uh, I got a note from Barbara Bush and she said, Karen, enjoy being second lady. She said, when I was second lady, I woke up every morning looking for something good that I could do. And the press Mm -hmm. didn't pay any attention at all. And she said, the minute George became the nominee for president, My tongue started getting me in trouble and it's gotten me in trouble ever since. (laughs) And so I knew, okay, the press, and I get it. I mean, why would they pay that much attention to what the second lady is doing? Uh, But my staff and I came up with about three or four things that we really wanted to sink our teeth into. And many people don't know anything about all the great things that we were able to accomplish. So I wanted to write a book talking about some of these initiatives and telling people those stories. Yeah, and what a great way to give a lens into an experience that people are really curious about, but obviously 99.9% of people will never have any proximity to, right? Being able to be open about that and really share what God was doing through your position and through you in that role. What, What have you learned because trust is such an important factor in life. And again, it has come up every time your family talks about their faith. Trust is a word that I hear you talk about. And trusting God, seeking God before, you know, Mike runs for vice president, former vice president runs for any office. And now he's running for president, you know, seeking to make sure that's what God wants. What have you learned about trust? What has been the biggest lesson as time has gone on when you reflect and look back? 
Well, that's a great question because, and I, I try throughout the whole book, I try to relate this back to the reader because I want them to feel free to question, you know, is God really calling me to this? I mean, does he really want me to do this? Um, and so I tell a lot of those stories about how we came to decisions. Um, one of my favorite stories is when we made the decision to run for Congress a third time. And um, this might answer your question. We um, we had run twice and lost. And then we had our family. Mike had his talk radio show. I had a watercolor business. We were comfortable. We had just built a new home and life was very good. But then the seat that he had run for and lost became open. And we took a trip to a dude ranch in Colorado to kind of make a decision you know it was his birthday so it was a birthday trip but we still we had to make a decision and i remember mike saying you know we've got to make a decision karen i mean people have to know if we're going to run or not but by now billy we had three small kids they were five six and seven and we had this new home we were comfortable they were all in school and I couldn't imagine raising my family in Washington, D.C. To me, it was like the most foreign thing. But we started looking into God's word. We started praying a lot about it. We started asking friends. And finally, we had to come to a decision. And Mike and I took a horseback ride up to a bluff in the Teddy Roosevelt National Forest. And we got off of our horses and we sat on the side of this bluff. And Mike said, it's time to make a decision. And right then, these two hawks, red-tailed hawks, were rising on the wind, and they were just going up and up in the air, and they were not flapping their wings at all. And he's kind of a romantic, and he said, those two hawks are like us. And I said, well, you know what? If those two hawks are like us, then I say we do it. But <laughs> this time, let's not do it out of ambition. Let's not push our way into this. Let's enter the race, make ourselves available. And if God wants to lift us up, then he can. And right then and there, we made the decision. And no flapping has kind of been our mantra ever since. And after you make those decisions, um, you have this peace that kind of settles on, on you. And it was after we made that decision, we had such peace. And we've kind of found that you know, throughout our lives and throughout the decisions that we've had to make. Running for president was a great example, too. I mean, I honestly, I I was resistant. For me, I thought, <laughs> whoa, we do this again? What? Go back to what? <laughs> we've done this. Um, but it's interesting. My daughter, Charlotte, you know, she helped me with this book. And I said, oh, Charlotte, no, 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 I don't. No, I don't want to do that. No, 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 no. We've, we've had our time. And she said, Mom, Maybe you need to read your book. And I said, whoa, you're right, because maybe God is calling us. And so Mike and I started a process of, uh, and we do it every single day, of reading through the Bible every morning and praying and, and seeing what we feel like God is calling us to do. And we both made the decision uh, sometime around Easter where we both felt called to enter this race and a peace just settled on us. And, and that's, that's kind of the story of every time we make those, those decisions. Yeah. The, the trust yields the peace and you can then navigate and journey through whatever it is you feel God's calling you to. And I think that is such a, I mean, you guys really, you give a great lesson to so many people because I do think a lot of us, we, we run with ambition first, or we see something in our sights and we want to go after it. And we don't actually take that time to make sure that this is something that God has for us. And it kind of, it brings me to another topic I wanted to ask you about because it can't be easy and or maybe it is, I don't know, but but when you're watching the person you love most in life uh, be attacked or maligned or people are saying things in the media about your family and you know they're not true. I'm one of those people when I know something's not true, I have this sense of justice where it frustrates me and I want people to know that that's not true. What is that like to journey through on such a major stage? Because that has been something, especially over the last couple of years with all of the debate an insanity that has has happened around your husband and your family. 
Well, that's a great question. Uh, you know, George Bush, uh, George W. Bush used to say that he didn't read the newspaper. Uh, he didn't <laughs> listen to the press. And I think that was very, very wise of him. And um, I don't pay a lot of attention to what people are saying on the outside. And when they do, I, you know, I, it's frustrating, of course, and it's, uh, it's kind of confusing sometimes. I'm like, where did they come up with that story? Where, where did they get that? <laughs> uh, and that happens actually on a very regular basis. But, um, but I think that, that one of the things that we've done in our home, one of the stories I tell in the book is, is about uh, election night when Mike became governor of Indiana. And we are a family that marks special occasions with little mementos or gifts and I knew the kids had a present for Mike, but I didn't know that they had a present for me that night. And they gave me this uh, three-part silver frame. And in each section, each one of our kids just wrote their favorite momism, their favorite quote from mom. And Michael's, my son, uh, his quote was, I'm not going to let what's going on out there affect what's going on in here. And so we have always tried not to let, you know, some crazy news story or some feature that they do trashing us uh, enter into our home. We've kind of tried to keep the home a sanctuary. And it's really helped a lot. And I think too, you know, our pastor uh, years ago, Michael Easley was our pastor. And he said, you know, we have an audience of one. And yes. when we remember, really, the Lord knows what's true. He knows my heart. He knows what we did. He knows how this was spun or twisted. It does give you that calm and that peace. He's really the only one that we need to please. Yeah. And that, and that goes back to the, again, the peace, the trust, all of these, all of these things that when we have our spiritual life in line, it can guide us along. And, and, you know, there's a lot of pressure there with the media, but I, I love that perspective of how you approach it. One of the big things, obviously, and you write and talk about this, uh, you know, January 6th, your husband going to fulfill his last official duty at the Capitol. And he was under a lot of pressure uh, to do something other than what he did, right? Which is what he was was supposed to do. How did you experience that pressure as as his spouse, as somebody who was there in the midst of, of that chaos? Well, that was an interesting time. And and I do talk a lot about that in the book because I, I'm talking about how, okay, here we were moving again. You know, I, I tell in the book that we've moved 18 times and here we were moving again uh, out of the vice president's residence in the midst of everything going on. But um, that day, uh, our daughter Charlotte was living with us for a little while because her husband was deployed. He's a Navy pilot. And so she said, you know, mom, I want to go because, you know, I mean, we have this life that we've lived at the Capitol. I mean, our kids were all Senate pages. We, when they were little, they got to go on the floor and vote for their dad. And we've been to all of these state of the unions and so many special events at the Capitol. And so she said, you know, I, I want to go. I mean, this is dad's last thing. This is his last official duty at the U.S. Capitol. And I said, well, I'm going to be with him too. So yeah, let's, let's go together. But we, we didn't really know what was going to transpire that day. And, and Charlotte had even said, you know, I'm, I'm probably not going to stay for the whole thing, but I, I want to go. Well, little did we know what was going to end up happening, but it's just like you just said a minute ago, Billy, it's that peace when you're trusting the Lord, that peace just settled on us. Um, people always ask me, were you afraid? And I, I wasn't afraid. None of us were really afraid. There was a sense of duty and urgency and what needs to happen now. And, and just seeing Mike's whole team come around him and make decisions and move forward and and get back in and finish their business was uh, really amazing to watch and very inspiring to see our democracy do what it's supposed to do. And 
at the same time, all three of our kids weighed in. Of course, two of them weren't with us, so they were worried seeing the news reports, but but they all called in and talked to Mike and uh, you know, he shared with them, these are the remarks, you know, when I go back on the floor and and they've always kind of been involved in the political life with us. And it was just a beautiful thing, actually, to witness, even though so much tragedy happened that day. Yeah. And, and you know, that tragedy has reverberated the division, which the division's not new. It was there before that. I think it's exacerbated a lot of that division. I think right now we're probably more politically and severely divided than I can remember, at least in my lifetime in quite some time. How concerned are you about the divisions and how deep they run in America right now? You know, it is concerning. I'm right there with you, Billy. I mean, it's uh, it is concerning to me to see um, how divided people are. I think that's one of the reasons that Mike felt called to run is, um, you know, people don't know this about him because maybe they just see him as the vice president. But throughout his career, Um, he's worked very closely with Democrats and had some very close friends in the Congress who were Democrats. Democrats who even had said to him, you know, if you ever run for speaker, I would vote for you, you know, and uh, people who asked him to uh, like co-host or or co-sponsor certain bills or, um, you know, the anti-Semitism caucus. These are groups that were mostly Democrats, but who reached out to him. And uh, he's always felt like what party, you know, you belong to shouldn't really affect whether or not we can have conversations. And I think a lot of things have changed in Washington, even, even in the Congress. You know, when he was in Congress, we used to have bipartisan retreats. Your whole family would go for a weekend it was Democrats and Republicans. Our kids would play with Democrat kids. And it was just a, a great thing. It was a way to kind of see people as, oh, you're you're a husband, you're a wife, you know, you have kids. And, you know, you're not just this suit that walks into the Capitol and votes. And I think they've gotten away from a lot of that. And and I think you know, people in the Congress need to be able to work together. And and that helps to kind of set the example in the tone for the country. Yeah, no, that's a great point. You know, I think people are looking right now, there's a crisis of leadership in a lot of ways, right? And people are looking for somebody they can kind of look up to. And, you know, we're not, we're not hearing those stories as much, even, you know, the joint prayer meetings that I know still go on, those things still happen, but you're not hearing about it as much. And I think, it's almost shocking when you do because people say, wait, you know, Democrats and Republicans would get together and talk about faith or talk about life. And it's it's like, yeah, that's what we should be doing, finding ways to gracefully disagree with one another instead of having this sort of toxic, you know, you have to hate the person who disagrees with you. That's not that's not the way to to move forward. But I wanna I wanna just ask you as a final question, when it comes to the book, when it's your turn to serve. What is success for you in the reader? What do you want them thinking and feeling? Um, You know, honestly, I want the reader to feel like they have an opportunity to experience God's grace in his calling for their life. And some of the stories that I tell, I know when we first decided to run for Congress, we really were hesitant about it then. And we had a verse then that was in Jonah. Those that cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And I think back to that first race so many times, and I think, what if we had been, you know, afraid to give up the idol of, you know, we just got married, we had our little, you know, bungalow home, and we were ready to start our lives. And and if we hadn't been willing to, you know, open our hands and let go of those worthless idols, we would never have seen and experienced the things and gone to places where God intended for us to go. You know, one of the sweet things about the book that I would love for the reader to take away is is the story of the honeybee. And I weave it throughout the whole book because that was one of my initiatives was the honeybees. But every chapter starts with a little fact about a honeybee. And it 
it kind of illustrates all of the the stories throughout the book. But if the reader could take away that they can experience God God's grace in His calling on their life, that that would be success for me. Well, I so appreciate you taking us through the book and your journey. It was really wonderful having you on today. Thank you, Billy.